Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about the distinction and disagreements between Giorgio Agamben and Michel Foucault, specifically just Agamben's criticisms of Foucault. I have to thank one of my students, Ella, for giving me this idea, who wrote about this in an essay, so I'm just stealing my students' ideas at this point. Thanks, Ella. Before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, like, share, subscribe. You'll see videos I release every week, sometimes twice a week. If you want to help me out, do those things. Like, share, subscribe. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal. Well, no pressure to do that. If you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on all other social things with all the links in the description. Won't that be fun? Then you can see pictures of my cats. That it'll be, it'll be the bee's knees. Be the cat's pajamas. You won't even know what to do with yourself. You'll have so much fun. Yeah, let's just jump into the distinction between Agamben and Foucault, specifically Agamben's criticisms of Foucault's notion of biopower and biopolitics, or the limitations of biopower and biopolitics, according to Agamben. But at the end of this, you really got to tell me whose side you're on. You agree with Agamben, Foucault? Tell me why. I really want to know. I want to expand my knowledge about this. Are my examples as good as they could be, specifically with the Holocaust, with the violence being inflicted upon Palestinians today, the case of Rwanda, the Congo. Does this get the biopolitical question across, and specifically the contention between Agamben and Foucault? Let me know. You gotta let me know whose side you're on, please. Now, to properly understand this, I'm gonna explain the Foucault, and then I'm gonna explain the Agamben. So to understand Foucault, in order to understand biopolitics, you have to understand the trajectory that power has undertaken from the classical age, from really the 1600s and before onward, where something shifted in the way that power was organized in Europe, in Europe for Foucault. Specifically, he says that at one time people were held under the rule of sovereign power. And what he means by that is that people lived under the will of royalty, of kings and queens. And those were the people that got to decide who got to live and who got to die, pretty much. That was how power worked. And the royalty would often put their power on display in like public executions, public tortures, in order to demonstrate their power, in order to communicate to the broader social body, like, hey, if you step out of line, this is gonna happen to you too. So often, and Foucault calls this, this the spectacle of the scaffold, he says that there was an entire spectacle around putting people to death. The army would be called in, there'd be all this pageantry and everything like that. Now the problem with this for Foucault is that it makes power too apparent. It becomes too easy to identify who holds the power. And as industrialization took foot, and as more people started to possess power in the form of monetary wealth, suddenly royalty, as we classically understood it, didn't have the same power and the same cultural weight it once did. So a new emerging system, that is a capitalist economy, it necessitated new ways to organize people. It didn't require a top-down approach of like, if you fall out of line, we're going to put you to death and punish you. Instead, it was a more kind of managerial power that started to seep in, where people would then start to occupy the role of police officer, of manager, of supervisor, of your boss, of your school teacher who occupy the place of power and whose job it is to direct you in the world. Now, many of you have work jobs, I imagine. One of the things that happens when you get a job and when you go up the ranks of that job is that as you get promoted, I ask you to think, what happens? Well, you get promoted to become like a supervisor and then a manager, which is totally weird. I mean, if you're doing a job really well, it seems strange that the response to that is, oh, you're doing your job so well, now you will no longer do it and you will watch other people do it instead. And it's like, what? But we equate the process of becoming a disciplinarian in the form of a supervisor or manager as a sign of progress. And that is a sign for Foucault that we have internalized discipline, we've internalized control and order to such an extent that we don't need some royal power or sovereign threatening us with a violence to keep us in line. Instead, we police and order ourselves. Now, Foucault takes this further to suggest that biopower enters the equation 
When enough knowledge has been accumulated by scientific authorities in order to properly understand what constitutes life. And this knowledge comes about after years of institutionalizing people in prisons, in mental asylums, of ostracizing people on the basis of their sexual orientation, institutionalizing them for those things as well. And what happened was throughout the 15th or the 1500s, 1600s, is that scientists caught wind of the fact that there were lots of people locked up that could be easily studied. And they could be really studied to understand what makes the body tick, but more specifically, how to best control these bodies that were currently being institutionalized and incarcerated throughout the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe. And so an entire medical knowledge emerged in order to understand bodies and people in order to best mold them and shape them. How much discipline should they endure? In what ways so that they will follow their orders, so that they'll show up to work the next day and be prepared to work for a grueling eight hours and have enough energy, just enough, like a perfect amount, to come back the next day and do the same thing, the bare minimum, in order to keep them going over and over again. Now this opens up an entire discourse around life science and life itself. Now what comes with this is a knowledge then about what a good life is. So here we get all of the science around like what a healthy body is supposed to look like, not to be too thin, not to be to overweight somewhere in the middle, a kind of normative idea about what a healthy body is. Also what it means to be a properly sexual person, what it means to be an upstanding law-abiding citizen. Like prisons, for example, don't exist to put Wall Street bankers who commit the most crimes and the most, you know, the crimes that affect the most people, they don't exist for those people. They exist for people who commit petty crimes, mostly against racialized people in order to maintain a pure social body. Now, purity that goes along the lines of a racial ordering, specifically in the context of the US, you can learn a lot about what the US perceives to be the standard American idea of what an American is by who they incarcerate, who is in prison. Therefore, these are signs of people who do not belong to the American norm or the American ideal. Now, life science would emerge in order to also justify racism, where these sciences emerged in order to then like measure people's skull sizes, to discern people on the basis of race, in order to hierarchize them, to say that some races are superior to others, and this would serve as justification for many of the colonial expeditions, also enslavement, where people in Western Africa would be distributed based off of their physical features, often backed up by like scientific discourse, like phrenology. This would then be repeated in Rwanda. The Tutsis and the Hutus were split up based off of their bodily configuration, backed up by, in a lot of ways, science and understanding people. So this is the progress towards biopolitical power for Foucault. And it is a power that doesn't try to put people to death per se to control them, but instead maps them according to their life properties. What are they in their bodies to channel them and shape them to adhere to a norm? Now, Foucault is not thinking that death doesn't happen anymore. In fact, he says that it is because of this logic that we can see the most horrendous deaths occur, where entire populations can be put to death because they threaten the perceived to be pure and true population. Like in the case of the Holocaust, where Jewish people were seen and Roma people and others who were put to death because they were in like a very systematic way because they did not abide by the normative idea about what it meant to be a standard white person in Europe and how that dovetails with religious authority as well. So the entire Holocaust was for Foucault a demonstration of this desire to purge the world of impurities in a systematic way by understanding it and shaping it. This is really relevant as well in the case of abortion where people who can give birth are forced to give birth as a kind of control mechanism. It is saying yes to life, but it's saying no to, to autonomy, it's saying no to choice, it's saying no to really bodily autonomy, which is like really the most important thing on earth, I would say, and what makes us human is to have bodily autonomy. But 
these are all demonstrations of the way that power has transformed from being an explicit demonstration of sovereign royal power in favor of a perfected systemic scientifically backed approach to better understand people and bodies to channel them and shape them in the most efficient way possible to prime them for a life of toil and work normative conditions about how to live like properly in the world and so on and that's really the crux of Foucault's notion of biopower now and I've done some episodes on that more just on Foucault if you want more on that but now Agamben and in a lot of ways Agamben is similar but in a lot of ways Agamben is not similar so in order to understand Agamben's criticism of Foucault we have to first understand that for Agamben life is not just what Foucault thinks it is like Foucault sort of takes the term uh, really in its simplest iteration whereas Agamben points out that like for the Greeks there are two ways to understand life as zoe or bios so for Agamben the Greeks understood that there's a difference between life as like a physical body really what is common between all living things like what I have in common with a cat or a fish or something like being alive the Greeks distinguish that from bios, or that's zoe, and then bios refers to specifically the conditions of living within a certain community. Now, within a political order, what we know from like Hannah Arendt, for example, is like the most basic thing that a human should expect in the face of political authority is to have rights. That is, that is the very basic thing. We have the right to have rights. And this points to bios, what is true to us in a political ordering that is part of our world. What gives us life, what sustains us, what is important for us to actually live in that world. It is a sign of bios being able to participate in that world and to have rights in that world. Now to jump back to Foucault just briefly, Foucault seems to be only focused on Zoe, specifically understanding bodies, like our physical life what makes us alive in our bodies and controlling that. So biopolitics is for Foucault, it seems to be, when Zoe has entered into politics and suddenly politics, legislators, and the people they talk to, like medical authorities, are interested in life, interested in controlling people by better understanding life and controlling life. Now where Agamben disagrees is that he doesn't think we've gone through these neat transformations from sovereign power to disciplinary power to biopower or biopolitics and to be fair Foucault doesn't really say that either Foucault for Foucault it's always more of like a spectrum like we've shifted away from sovereign power but it hasn't gone away completely but it's still like haunting us in any case Foucault is clear that these transformations have occurred to which Agamben is like that is only true if you ex if you operate with this very narrow idea about what life is and it doesn't account for zoe as an expression of life and bios because for Agamben the sovereign has always had power over zoe it was about who could live and who could die what lives were worth keeping alive and which lives were worth putting to death not to mention the sovereign has often had the power to take away people's political lives to take away their lives as political agents and the ability to have rights. So Agamben, so Agamben really simply asks, like, how much of this has remained consistent throughout time in the way that power is exercised like today, or as we will look at in the case of the Holocaust? Well, simply sovereign power, we can think of sovereigns as like people who rule states, simply enough, or army generals or other people in high places of authority. What we can still see about them that is true and has remained true about sovereignty and sovereign power is that they, they hold power over life in both senses, over both Zoe and Bios. They have the right to decide who gets to live and who gets to die, like directed controlled drone strikes to kill certain people decided by, given the okay by the President of the United States, for example, or any other state that demonstrates that it doesn't just control people by proliferating life by controlling life by understanding life in terms of birth rate and populations and understanding lifelong longevity and like body mass index and all of that and you know, controlling people that way 
this this kind of power seems only to be, to be reserved for like the upper middle classes in the United States and doesn't apply to everyone. And this is the limit of Foucault's approach. That is, when you're dealing with racialized people, especially in like the United States, for example, there is the constant threat of death, especially at the hands of police, how this is repeatedly an issue. Now, this continues if we also look at the way that imperialism functions today and colonialism functions today, where parts of the world, for example, are mined incessantly by American corporations in order to get lithium and cobalt and all of these other, like what's going on in the Congo right now, all of these other resources in order to really expand their own empires, where these people's lives are just like not worthy of being alive at all. And here enters another important term from Agamben, and that is homo soccer. It is a situation in which people, because of the nature of sovereign power itself, not because it's changed or anything, this is how it's always been, sovereign power decides whose lives are worth keeping alive and whose lives are not even worth considering, where their lives and their deaths don't matter at all. And in this case, people are reduced to the status of what he calls bare life where their bios, their political identity, their ability to have rights is taken away and all that's left is them as just bare living creatures. And in that moment, their deaths mean nothing. They're just put to death and it's not like anyone will be held on trial for the deaths that they've inflicted, like in the case of the Holocaust, where Jewish people's lives and Roma people's lives and others were just, it's not like anyone's gonna be held accountable because they were less than human in their reduction to just pure life, just the absolute bare minimum to stay alive. Many of them didn't just because of the conditions and then many were just put to death and that did not count for anything. That did not count. It was just an absolute erasure of people, of cultures, of identities in a very systematic way. So for Agamben, something like the Holocaust is not the result of an increasing medical knowledge about how to best control people, how to best channel them, and then establish a norm about what constitutes the proper social body against which others who do not comply can be systematically then put to death, where their lives don't meet up with this norm. For Agamben, it is in, within the entire framework of sovereign power to always be putting people to death, to always be ending life. Now we can see a similar argument on display in Ashid Mbembe's Necropolitics, in which he looks at the case of Palestinian people whose lives are just reduced to nothing. Their lives are not worth keeping alive at all. They're repeatedly dehumanized in order to justify their continual, the continual violence inflicted against them, where their land means nothing. They have no attachment to their land. They have no real claim to the land they live on, to their own homes. And so they are systematically destroyed and taken over by Israeli forces and held under constant control and surveillance where the Palestinian people are just kept in this arrested state of development where they cannot engage in any kind of bios, any kind of like political life and are respected as such by the international community. It is that their lives, as Agamben says about homo soccer, are just like a statistic. At this point now, given Israel's continued attacks on the Palestinian people, we have more than 8,000 dead children, which just at this point, as it is repeated by Western forces, by Western media, is just a statistic. It is just something that is only offered up as a statistic. Their children, them being children, is also then attached to a terrorist agenda, like they are human shields or something when at the end of the day, they're really just children and as a global community, they should be understood as such. There's really nothing more to add to it than that. But their deaths account for nothing. They mean nothing. And so they are just reduced to this status of bare life. And this has been the way that sovereign power has always functioned and how it continues to function today. So yeah, let me know what you think. Are you on Agamben's side, Foucault's side, a little bit of both? I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. And on that note, catch you next time. Take care.